Who is this man? This bum, this drunk? It's I, Tommy Farrell. I'm sorry and ashamed that you see me like this. I thought that I could run away from you. Yes, you and everyone else. For a month I've been trying to run away, to escape from myself and from reality. I thought that if I drank enough I could forget, forget who I am and forget the grief and anxiety I've caused my family and my friends. I'm an artist, or was. Among advertising men, I'm known as the fair-haired boy of poster art, especially liquor poster art. You've all seen my work, or at least some of it. I know you're all familiar with liquor ads. Everywhere you look, you see them. You've caught me at a pretty bad time. But I might as well face you. I can't hide anymore. Believe me when I say this could happen to you, or to a friend, or even to your family. Listen to my story and watch closely. Then maybe you'll believe. As I was stumbling through this oil field along the Pacific coast, I didn't realize that an old friend, John Manning, was close by, getting information for an advertising campaign, a campaign for beach oil. And Manning didn't realize that the staggering character pointed out to him was me. Yes, Tommy Farrell, to whom he'd offered a lucrative position several years ago. And it all started with one drink. Not even whiskey at that. It started with one drink of beer, but that one glass of beer was a lighted fuse that set up a whole powder keg of misery. When I started with that one beer, I smashed open a whole Pandora's box of anxiety, pain, and nerve-shattering despondency. That one drink of beer started me in a vicious circle that led from beer to wine to whiskey and later a combination of the three. Finally, I was driven to taking sedatives, or goofballs, as they're called on Skid Row, in an effort to soothe my jumping nerves, nerves made raw by alcohol. At this point, I'd sunk so low, or thought I had, the only solution to my problem seemed to be to do away with myself. Yes, I know, the coward's way out, I know that. But you must remember that my brain was clouded with alcohol, that I was anything but rational. First, Manning didn't recognize me. I doubt if my own wife would have. But when he did, the shock of witnessing a near tragedy coupled with the realization that the would-be suicide was an old friend prompted him to take charge of me, forcefully but gently. See, he was wise enough not to start firing questions at me. He wanted to take me to his home and call a doctor. Fresh air revived me considerably, and at my insistence, we pulled in at an auto park where I started to tell Manning what had happened to me. I was sick, scared, and ashamed, but I wanted to talk. Manning asked if I was having trouble at home with Dorothy, my wife. No, no, it wasn't that. My business, up to the last time I'd been at the office, business was excellent. I had a fine office in a beautiful building. I was making money hand over fist, turning out poster art for several brewers and distillers. It wasn't the type of work I wanted or liked, but it paid extremely well. I constantly had the feeling that I was helping to sell the public a legitimate, but insidious drug. I was helping to plaster the countryside and the city streets with obnoxious liquor ads, enticing people to drink, constantly reminding them of alcohol. Well, that's when the trouble began. In 
In a mood of depression, I decided to follow the advice on a poster I was doing. Feel bad, have a glass of ale. Well, one wouldn't hurt, I thought. And it might help. It didn't, and I forgot to stop at one drink. In fact, I kept drinking and forgetting. I even talked to a girl at the bar who was a perfect stranger. She accepted my invitation for a drink, a glass of beer. That drink was real, but later I learned that she was employed by the bar to solicit drinks from customers. When she ordered whiskey, she was given cold tea. Of course, she got a cut from each drink she could wrangle from a pickup. You see, I was on the way down, but fast. Then, one morning, one morning after I'd been out drinking all night, I staggered home. Just in time for my wife and daughter to see me. My daughter frightened turn from me. Dorothy, perturbed but understanding, helped me up the steps. I promised Dorothy that I'd stop drinking, and I tried. I really did. But my nerves were on edge. I found out how ragged my nerves were one day when my wife dropped into the office to say hello. I blew up for no reason whatsoever, no reason. She merely mussed my hair a bit. It was just a little gesture of affection on her part. I tried to stop drinking, but no matter what I did or where I went, I was constantly reminded that a drink could be had almost anywhere, at any time, for almost any price. Everywhere I looked, I saw liquor ads. To make matters worse, it was but a few weeks to Christmas, but I couldn't see the colorful decorations. The whiskey ads were in the way. Every magazine I picked up seemed filled with information and advice upon how to be the life of the party the possessor of a clear head and the owner of a sweet-tasting breath, if only the reader would buy and drink the best whiskey or the cheapest, or just any old liquor at all, just as long as it contained alcohol. I was particularly aware of the thousands of outdoor displays, partly because I designed so many of them. Even the buses and streetcars were plastered with liquor ads. And on the radio, the commercials were continuously touting beer and wine. One display I saw every day as I left the office covered the entire side of a 12-story building. One day at the office, I thought I could stand it no more unless I had a drink. I kept a bottle in the desk now. I used to drink at night and then before lunch, but now, now I started in the morning. I was associating with people I never would have associated with were I sober. I was even giving my money away to a bar girl whose only interest I knew was in how much she could get out of me, but I didn't care. I was afraid to go home now. Oh, I knew that Dorothy would stick by, would try to understand, and would certainly do anything to help me. 
But I'd gotten to the point where I was ashamed, confused, and getting more irrational by the hour. I didn't want anyone I knew or loved to see me. I'd work this out all right. At night, when I roamed the streets, the same old signs glared at me. Those leering, beckoning neon signs dragged me away from what senses I had left and into any bar that might be handy. Soon I was on Skid Row, yeah, the end of the line for me and for thousands of others. Here in these brick and cement jungles, found in almost every city of any size, are countless men all trying to escape, existing only for the next drink, begging, stealing, and even sometimes killing for enough money to buy another drink and another and another. Here I could get raw wine for 39 cents a quart and whiskey for a dime a shot. 50 cents would buy me a ticket to oblivion. The next morning would always come around, and the light of day would bring out all the hidden fears and the despondency that I'd tried to drown in alcohol the night before. Only the fears would be magnified, and my shaking hands would tremble so badly that I could hardly lift another drink to my lips, another drink in an attempt to quiet my screaming body. Thousands of others were doing the same thing, some of them hardly in their teens. Many veterans of the last war and of the first there were old, old men living only to drink and drinking to live. I had to have money for a drink, for a bottle. I had one thing left with me that would interest a pawnbroker, an expensive foreign camera that Dorothy had given me on our last anniversary. I'd been in the habit of carrying it with me always for photographing outdoor scenes that might be used in future advertising posters. Now I would sell it for the price of two more days' drink to keep me going. To keep me going for what? I wasn't choosy about where I did my drinking now. Any convenient alley would do. Stay out of the bars, I figured. It's cheaper than the cheapest bar to buy the stuff by the bottle and drink outside, just as long as the law didn't see me. I still had my feet out of the gutter, almost. My nerves throbbing from alcohol, yelled for something to quiet them. Alcohol alone wasn't enough, so I found a man who would sell me sedatives, sleeping pills without a prescription, and for a price. Now I was down to gutter level. Alcohol and sleeping pills. Alcohol to pep me up, try to make myself feel like a human being, sedatives to quiet me down, to cancel the ravishing effects of drink. The two combined to make me one of the skid row living dead. I entered into a nightmare existence now. When I awakened from that drink and drug stupor, I wandered down to the waterfront where several days later Manning found me. Manning called his doctor, who examined me carefully, and then told me that I was in pretty bad shape. Fortunately, this spree that I'd been on was an isolated incident. Had it been habitual or of longer duration, it could have meant my life. 
Up to the time when I began to drink, I'd been in good physical condition. But even so, the road back to reality was a hard one, one I'd not care to travel over again. My wife came to see me as soon as the doctor thought it advisable. She didn't ask one question that might cause me remorse. We had a silent understanding between us that closed the book on this sordid chapter in my life. After I was well enough to get out of bed, a plan formed in my mind to help others who might find themselves haunted by the constant reminders of ever-present liquor ads. Dr. Cardwell helped me. He'd been fighting the whiskey interest for years. He pointed out that alcohol, like sedatives, was a hypnotic. It might be classed as habit-forming. The doctor gave me a booklet. It was the Union Signal, the weekly publication of the Woman's Christian Temperance Union. Until then, I had no idea how deeply this organization had gone into the fight against alcohol, and with proven figures and facts to back up their fight. The figures were terrifying. Around $9 billion spent last year for liquor, nearly twice that amount spent in fighting crime and vice, which had started with a drink. To say nothing of the cost in lives and dollars caused by drinking drivers, Dr. Cardwell left me with a final bit of advice. Stop smoking, Tommy, and you will feel like a new man. Lungs were not made to be filled with smoke and nicotine. I presented my plan to Manning. Why not a law to force all distillers to put warning labels on each and every bottle containing an alcoholic beverage? The label to read, warning, may be habit forming. That would help stop drinking and would certainly keep the younger people from ever taking that first drink. Manning liked the idea so well that he arranged for me to meet his biggest client, Mr. George Jason, president of Beach Oil. We met at Mr. Jason's Beverly Hills home. There he told me that he was having many problems at his refineries and oil wells. There had been many accidents and much absenteeism amounting to thousands of lost hours. Accidents and absenteeism caused directly by alcohol. Well, I outlined my campaign to combat liquor advertising and alcohol in general. I showed him many pages of liquor ads cut at random from dozens of national magazines. The ads were designed to attract both the young and the old, the drinker and the non-drinker. Invariably, they boldly suggested that to be a real man, a man of distinction, a man looked upon as a success in business, and the life of the party, it was necessary only to buy a certain brand of whiskey or wine or beer. What a joke. What a tragic joke. It was a vicious campaign to lure as much of the population as possible into a trap baited with ridiculous possibilities. Drink this, drink that. Alcohol, the great panacea, the great cure-all. Alcohol was being ballyhooed all over the nation. Our country was taking on the aspect of an old-time medicine show. I pointed out to Jason the great possibility of using warning labels on liquor bottles as a stopgap between the distiller and his advertising and the probable consumer of his product. Dr. Cardwell explained that the plan was not only feasible and ethical, but was desperately necessary to the nation's well-being. I further told Mr. Jason that I thought it a good idea to place in schools and in churches and factories and wherever possible cartoons lampooning the liquor industry and liquor advertising. Cartoons designed to tell the truth about alcohol, to show that almost everything that is undesirable in our lives today can be traced to the use of alcohol as a beverage. Most crime and vice and gambling exist because alcohol is somewhere in the background. Jason was immediately impressed with my ideas and he suggested that Manning and I leave with him for Washington as soon as possible. 
Two days later, I said goodbye to my family and we drove down to the station to board a train for Washington. My personal battle is won. Now I'm about to enter into a greater battle. The fight to tone down insidious liquor advertising and the fight to eventually remove alcohol from the American scene and way of life. I learned the hard way. And I want to make it possible for you to avoid in any degree the suffering that I have endured just because of that first drink, that first glass of beer. Take heed, my friends, I implore you. Take heed. As we faced the Capitol and marched up those broad steps, I felt that we were fighting for our homes, our children, our very country, even our sanity. <laughs> 